What's up, everybody? I want to welcome to the show today, Andrew Bruzy. How's it going, Andrew? How's it going, Ben? Hey, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today on a Friday. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people are uh, you know already out there in the uh, in the happy hour world over here, but you made time for us. I appreciate that. Thank you so right. much. I appreciate. It. I know where I'm going after this. <laughs> there you go. So, where speaking of which, where in the world are you right now? Yeah, and so actually, and speaking of uh, happy hour, so I'm in Arizona right now. So I'm out visiting with some clients, but uh, my brother happens to have a vineyard here. So since uh, the, because of that, I go for free accommodations and free wine. So it's right in the uh, next room. So I'll be going into the tasting room after this. <laughs> free accommodations and free wine. I mean, what more do you want? Right. Oh my gosh. A bottomless Uber account. Maybe that's right. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's awesome. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're out there in, uh, in Phoenix. Okay. So yeah, so it's like, what's like one o'clock years. A lot of people out there in Phoenix right now. Um, are you, uh, you there for any uh, particular uh, conference or anything like that? No, there is a conference that I've been kicking around of going to uh, next week. So the, um, actually I came out here and then I went back to Arkansas. That's where we're headquartered. And okay. then uh, came back out, and there is a conference next week that is on uh, basically developing HR, the the base HR skills. So people that are just getting into HR, and so I was thinking about going to that uh, just to see if there would be some value in it. But yeah, really. So so like not necessarily a mobility conference, but an HR conference. Yeah, and actually, uh, so uh, again, this is unprompted, so I should probably mention that. But it, part of the inspiration was actually from you on that, uh, where you were mentioning that there's a uh, there's a gap in the uh, HR conferences of mobility professionals. So with having a skill set in global mobility, there's lots of times when they'll voice problems. And a big thing with Vendium is that we go for is kind of workforce augmentation, um, where we'll use technology and things like that to help HR and their function. So not just global mobility. We started as a global mobility platform, but uh, whenever HR needs support, that's what we're looking to help them on. Yeah. So when you said that, uh, the first thing I thought of was like, hey, that's a really good idea. <laughs> so I'm glad, <laughs> yeah. actually, I'm glad you actually like uh, I, you heard me say that because um, you know, that epiphany happened for me back at the, uh, at the Sherm conference mm-hmm. back in Vegas last year, where, uh, I went out there, you know, with some colleagues and, um, I went out there with some colleagues and we met with, I literally scanned 2000 badges. <laughs> so I, I talked to 2000 people, at least to the extent of, Hey, let me scan your badge enter, enter, enter to win. Um, but as I was having these conversations with these, you know, these prospective customers, these HR, you know, they were generalists, they were comp and bend people, they were talent, they were, you know, training and learning. They were, you know, a lot of generalists and they have no concept of, of, of mobility for the most part. I'd say 95% of them have no concept of mobility. Uh, I'd say 95% of their companies, um, don't do anything. Maybe 80% of the companies don't do anything at all, which is to say when they do relocate people, they're going like a lump sum route. And it just occurred to me like, dang, like the educational opportunity is not at worldwide ERC. It's at Sherm, you know, and that's the people we need to reach. We need to go further upstream, you know? Um, so anyway, so that's really smart of you to to be focusing on that. And, and oh, no, I appreciate that. And, and that's absolutely true. I, I mean, there's so originally when I started Vendium, Vendium's you know, almost two years old now. So it's still definitely in the startup phase. But uh, I started approaching a lot of global mobility professionals with uh, some of our solutions. And the interesting thing with global mobility professionals is they generally don't need global mobility consulting, right? Because they are already uh, yeah. subject matter experts. They, they are practice. the global mobility consultant for the organization. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so when there may be something that they're weak on, but if they're weak on it, then transparently it requires them to admit that they're weak on it or they don't want to because that's what they get paid to. I mean, know. we've all been there, right? We're talking to a client <laughs> and we're trying to like give them some ideas and they're kind of like, I know everything. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Happens. Well, and, Happens. and so for HR, they're a lot more of a receptive partner. And especially where we uh, position Vendium in the the space of 
you know, we're not a relocation management company. We're not a um, on the corporate side necessarily. What, what we'll do is kind of act as an intermediary between the two and make sure everyone has fun toys to play with. That's why I always say that I like to open up my toy chest and then see what everyone wants to play with. All right, before we before we go down the rabbit hole that is your toy chest, <laughs> I want to back up here. I want to back up a second and I want to get to know you because this is Love and Relo, so this is about people, right? Sure. Um, where are you from? Yeah, so I'm originally from Connecticut, so a little town uh, called Washington Depot. The only claim to fame of it is it's actually the town that Gilmore Girls was based on. Okay, so so I'm from I'm from uh, I grew up in White Plains, New York, Westchester oh, County. Very cool. Yeah, so, I'm in Nashville that, County. So I mean, right right on the border. Okay, because I saw the last name, you know, Brutzi, and I'm yep. like, <laughs> that was a lot of guys I went to high school with. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. All right, so uh, so you're from Connecticut. All right, cool, and then. And then how did you end up in in Arkansas? Ah, yes. Rogers, Arkansas. Now my mom is from Arkansas. I got like a whole I'm bunch sure. of family. I got a family reunion at a lake somewhere. Mm -hmm. I know about Arkansas a little yep. bit. More do you than know where in Arkansas? Arkansas? What's that? Do you know where in Arkansas? It's a weird name. It's a lake. Um no. No, I don't. It's like in the so, middle. Uh, Beaver Lake is is one of the larger ones, and that's uh, right near me. So this is a yeah. weird name. I'll find it. Huh? I'll find it. I'll find it. How did um, you end up in Arkansas, though? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I um, so I, I uh, went to high school in Connecticut, and then I started university in Connecticut. I kind of I think as all people from small towns wanted to get a kind of far away from it. So mm -hmm. I moved out to Denver, Colorado. And so that's where I finished my degree of a uh, bachelor's in international business. And um, from there, I, while I was in school, I started an import export brokering company. So essentially uh, drop shipping. And um, then that moved to like the consulting side where I'd help other international business majors and moving their products internationally. So tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, started, you started a drop shipping business Mm -hmm. But not like a like an eBay kind of drop shipping business, like an e-commerce or like. Uh, well, so I mean, just the full gambit. It started originally with I had some friends that um, that had this company that they were trying to get off the ground. And then we had to look for suppliers of it. And so it was herbal tea. So not like that kind of herbal tea in Colorado. But <laughs> the, No judgment. Yeah, um, right. hey, shout out to Planet Janet Apothecary for the beard balm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had to throw the plug in. But uh, yeah, so they, they required like sourcing for their products. Uh, eventually just start like if we can sell tea, we can sell anything and move from there to fresh produce. And uh, yeah, just by the nature of it, it was it was a really cool feeling to know that I can just have uh, my laptop and be able to facilitate shipments uh, across the world. And, uh, and there was a different times when we would import them to have them repackaged in the United States and whatever packaging that we want, just basically blank label items and could sell it under our brand. Uh, so, so you you're talking about around the world and made me remember, um, I didn't ask everybody, if I'm going to stop you. I didn't ask everybody check in. Okay, guys. I uh, want to see uh, post uh, where you're at, name of your company, something funny if you want to, or a question for Andrew, whatever, but at least put, uh, put where you're coming from and uh, name of your company. I want to give everybody a shout out here. Um, Sometimes we get some representation from some really cool areas. So uh, yeah. I love when I can touch all the major continents. South mm -hmm. America doesn't – I'm not big in South America, though, I've noticed. So Oh, interesting. I have some clients in South America, so hopefully I can help. Tell them to get on here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little frustrating. Um, so going back to this, so you're, you're, you're importing products, uh, mm -hmm. is produce, you're white labeling it, you're mm -hmm. putting it under your, your brand. Really cool. And you're doing this in college? Yeah, yeah. So it you're was, really hustling, man. Like you're doing oh, your thing. You. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, you know, from even high school, I always kind of worked for myself. So when I was in high school, I had an office cleaning business and then sold that. And that's what made me able to buy my first house when I was in college. And I realized that my my savings um, was going down a lot faster than I would have liked. And it would have involved me to go get a job and take time to study and all that. So yeah. I uh, just started trying to figure out if I could make money on my own. And yeah, it worked. So, so then, so then, take me from you know selling kumquats, you know, under the Bruzy brand yep. to um, how did you get into mobility? 
Sure. So in it, I actually had a bit of a debacle when I was Love handling debacles. Tell me more. Yeah. So I was um, sending a container load of tea that was under my label um, to a department store in France. Okay. And we ran some packaging testing. And at the time, transparently, I didn't know what I was doing. I was <laughs> I was yeah. figuring it out as I was going. Yeah. Um, had the packaging tested because I thought, now well, we're we're officially like a proper company. Need to make sure that everything is is taken care of. And the uh, containers that we're using are made. M- mistake number one: thinking you're like an official company and like you need to like adhere to like doing what you think companies are supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. Mistake number one: go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, long story short, the containers were, um, we found out that they were made out of uh, recycled, I guess, like diesel containers or something. They were they were from China. Um, and it was a, a great example of why like ISO 9000 manufacturing standards uh, mean so much. Because if you say food grade in one country, food grade may mean something different in another. So um, in China, they might eat out of diesel containers, but in France, they don't. Well, not that extreme, but yeah, it was a it lesson was learned. Contaminated items. There was lead paint on it. Um, I had to have them drop, uh, uh, dump the entire ship and send them. Out of tea. So it was twenty thousand pounds of tea that they had to get rid of. So it was like the Boston Tea Party, but in France. Yeah. Yep. So, and so it was very embarrassing. Um, and so I, um, after that, I, I was thinking that like, okay, maybe I don't know everything that I think that I know. <laughs> so um, I, I could either keep going that it was a major financial hit. Um, sure. But I, uh, so actually right by my house in Denver happened to be the Grable headquarters. And okay. so I had a, um, actually a, a former professor that said, well, you know, you're into moving products. Why don't you try to move people? And so I went into um, for an interview with them, got the job um, and started working for for Grable. So, um, yeah, I started. How did you, you get down to Arkansas? Ah, yeah. So uh, fast forward, I um, moved a couple of different positions with Grable. So I went from an a, a international assignment associate to a consultant to a project manager. Uh, When I was a project manager, and actually funny story about this, uh, I went for my first six-week assignment in Arkansas for Walmart. For Uh, Walmart. mm -hmm, Yep, to write their uh, global assignment program. So their policies and tools that they needed and things like that. Uh, So I, uh, as soon as I ended up landing in Arkansas, uh, and especially for the, I I think kind of the stereotypes and all of that, uh, so for anyone that's arrived in Arkansas, they land in XNA, which is a very small airport. There quite literally is one baggage claim. Um, is this Fort Smith? Uh, no, Fort- so this is actually Northwest Arkansas. So Northwest Arkansas. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, so as soon as I land there, uh, grab my bag, grab the rental car, start driving from the airport. And I just got a debriefing of the company, what the project basis was, uh, was like kind of, just 30,000 foot view. Yep. And as I'm uh, driving from the airport, I call one of my colleagues and I start going off. And I'm like, I think they're trying to fire me. I must have done something wrong. I see cows from the airport. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, when I when I drove with my wife from New York, she grew up in Staten Island. Mm-hmm. We, went, we, we moved down to Dallas. We drove through Arkansas. We stayed with my, my family in Little Rock, woke mm-hmm. up, ate at a Waffle House. Between Little Rock and Dallas, she broke down in tears looking at these little dilapidated wooden shacks and oil derricks on the side of the road mm-hmm. and thought I was taking her off to like go churn butter for the rest of her life in Little House on the Prairie. That's oh, what she yeah. thought it was. So I get you. I know what it is. I know what it's like. I've seen those tears. Yep. Oh, sure, sure. And, and actually in Northwest Arkansas itself is a bubble. So there, mm-hmm. it's different than most of Arkansas. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it's one of the more developed areas and one of the more uh, regularly referred to it as a uh, suburb without an urban area. There's not a city that it's attached to. It's just it's own little suburb well because you have you have bentonville right Mm -hmm. so you got walmart which was for forever the largest company in the country or maybe the world yeah and then the largest private employer yeah and then you've got fayetteville which is where the university is right so you have some some educated you know folks and Mm -hmm. you know so you got a lot going on there a lot of people don't know that about northwest arkansas so yeah no and actually fun fact about it is uh, so 
Uh, there are, uh, so Walmart requires that any suppliers for Walmart have an office location there. So whenever they have a, uh, so you have a lot of Fortune 500 companies that at the very least have representation, but Tyson's headquartered there, JB Hunt, um, you have a ton of different companies that um, already have their base there. And especially even if, when you get into uh, Southern Arkansas, you have like Murphy Oil, Murphy USA. So mm -hmm. if you're familiar, if you've ever driven through sure. the country and seen those gas stations. So, yeah. Sure. Awesome. So you're so you're going down there. You think you're about to get fired. It turns out they didn't send you to Arkansas to fire you. Yep. But instead, they wanted you to work there. What what, what did your role develop into? Like, kind of flash forward to like your your height of your uh, the height of your role at, at Walmart. Sure, sure. Well, and so um, with this, I it, um, I I did the assignment to write the the global assignment program. Bounced back to uh, Arkansas, came out for a three month assignment, extended for another three months where I was leading the on-site team. And then the uh, then Walmart had a position open that was, uh, the title was supplier and policy manager. And I thought that was fascinating because again, coming from the RMC side um, and having written policies, I thought that someone had written that job script just for me. So I uh, went ahead and joined the corporate side. Um, but yeah, that was, I, I was with Walmart for about five years, I, a little bit over five years when I hit my five year mark, I put in my notice, but the, um, yeah, during that time, it, um, I had different operational roles. Originally yeah. it was a, a, the supplier and policy piece where we just managed. Uh, so Walmart has three onsite RMCs and they, um, actually one of them is no longer on site, but. Um, they have three RMCs that manage their move. So that's why they required someone to kind of be that point person. And then from there, it moved into a global operations role. And uh, yeah, then from there, it we started adding more to the team, started taking on more business globally and then breaking it out by region. So, uh, yeah. So before I, before I go into the next chapter mm -hmm. of your life, uh, we want to do some shout outs because I told people I would. Right. So love you guys out there for watching right now. Uh, Janet Turner says, hey, love you, Janet. Joe Fick says hello from sunny Malibu, California, Compass Real Estate and Pivot app. Uh, thanks, Joe. You're always tuning in. I appreciate you. I look forward to having you and Lynn on the show soon from Pivot app. Uh, Matthew Coelho, U.S. Bank, St. Louis, love and reload. You know, you know it, Matt. Uh, Brittany Hardbarger, Brittany Hardbarger, Walmart, Walmart Global Mobility. Mm -hmm. Yo, uh, I know Brittany well. <laughs> so the Walmart people are in the house. Also got David Welch in Bentonville, Arkansas right now. Mm -hmm. I know so, David as well. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Thomas Cannell and Tommy Cannoli. Hey, guys, greetings from Philly. Penn State Lax versus Villanova. Always plugging the uh, – we're, we're huge with the uh, Penn State lacrosse program, by the way. Makes up for the lack of South American representation. Katie Linehan, uh, Grable, hashtag Connecticut Mobility Specialist. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. We got to start that, get that trending. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. There's not very many. <laughs> um, actually, you know, Connecticut is like the capital of mobility. Yeah, you know, I, I'm eating Isn't my that weird? I say there's not very many, but then we like, okay, a, a little company of anyone's ever heard of Cardis, maybe. I, <laughs> you know, like, Occasionally they come yeah. up. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, but because, and because of Cardiff and all these people like spun off of there and now you have all these, these, these mobility folks that, that, that are there and all these RMCs that have headquarters there and stuff, probably service in their New York, New York clients. Uh, Michael James. Hey guys, uh, sweet America out of El Dorado Hills, California. Awesome. Let's see. Uh, Janet Turner, Staten Island in the house represent. All right. <laughs> Paula. Oh, yeah, I got a little Paula from Facebook. Hi Ben. Happy birthday. That's Paula. It's not a dog. That's Paula. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, she's great. Paul is not the dog. Paula, <laughs> happy Friday, Ben and Andrew. You know, Paul, thank you so much for always tuning in. I do appreciate you. Travis Washer, general manager of University Moving and Storage in Cincinnati. Katie Lenahan says a legacy prudential. So that's where she's mm -hmm. saying she's from. So very cool. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, if you have questions for Andrew, please leave them. I'd love to get, help you uh, get this conversation started, answer whatever's on your mind. Um, so, Andrew, now. You're talking about the, uh, you know, going through your Walmart career. Yeah. You decide to leave Walmart. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that like? And what did you do after that? Sure, sure. So I had started Vendium probably, well, it was so in June of the year before I left. So I originally did it just because there was a, a great example. Um, so, and, and this is a great example for any of your corporate RMC leaders 
we were writing an article on our corporate mobility team or on our uh, corporate uh, buyout program rather. Um, and it was for the Wall Street Journal. Really excited about it. Went ahead and put all this work into it. We got all the onsite RMCs involved like, and it put in some really quality content. Uh, after the legal and corporate communications team got done with it, it turned into Walmart spokesperson said this line. I don't even remember what that line was. It just right. it wasn't even worth saving. Um, right. So for that, I started Vendium in order. Are to we talking about? Talking, can we just say lawyers are the worst? Okay, uh, lawyers are the worst. Attorney. Lawyers are the worst. They take so, the so traditional take lawyers. Joy. I have a business Yoda. <laughs> anyway, so you wrote you so so they they reduced you to one line and attributed it to a Walmart spokesperson, and yeah. and and you decided, hey, that's that's it. I'm out of here. Yeah, and so one it's of Jerry McGuire, the whole thing. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so uh, one of the things, and um, so both David Welsh and, and Brittany that are watching right now, they've been involved, so they know a lot of um, a lot of even what I'm going to say here. So they. Um, one of the natures of, well, I originally started working for Walmart. I'll say this, uh, because if you want to make the biggest impact, use the biggest stage and by being the fortune one company, then they are the biggest stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think I mentioned to you just separately that when you have that much volume, then efficiency needs to become a thing. It, it's something as simple as a click, a, a click can take anywhere from one to five seconds. So if you end up doing a number of clicks doing a process. If you can save clicks in doing that, especially in an organization like Walmart, you're saving actual hard dollars. And, and, and that kind of efficiency actually drives an impact just because it's an order of magnitude. You're not talking about if you and I are doing something just on our own in our, our daily life, it doesn't really matter. If there's 2.3 million Walmart associates, if every single one of them has to do an extra step, then that's significant. Um, so for a lot of that, when, uh, so originally wanted to, to use Vendium for like writing articles and things like that. And then I started realizing that a lot of the, uh, the efficiencies that were driving within Walmart, a lot of other companies needed them. So, uh, so you initially started Vendium as a content, as a content platform. Yeah, basically like an educational piece. So yeah. um, for my first role with Walmart, it was, uh, so I mentioned supplier and policy manager. The role was in charge of supplier policy um, uh, communication and training. And so I love the the training piece of it and, and educating people on mobility because I happen to be a mobility and technology geek, which is mm -hmm. hence Vendium. And so I wanted mm -hmm. to use it to write articles and um, and help educate people, which again, kind of morphed it into a consultant. So what was that pivot? So, so pivoted from that to, to what now? Yeah. So, so, um, so you were saying, what, what am I, uh, what does Vendium Yeah. Like, do? so how did it evolve? What, what is, yeah. what does Vendium do now? So Vendium has actually had a number of pivot points, um, wow. never actually changing what it was. But so originally I, uh, when I was with Walmart, just obviously for, for conflict of interest uh, pieces, it was more for educational pieces. And then I realized that a lot of companies were, had gaps in that educational uh, space. And when I was still with Walmart, I designed a couple chatbots to help answer questions because whenever you deal with that kind of order of magnitude, you're getting hundreds of emails potentially a day. You have people asking you questions all the time. And I always love when, um, and again, Brittany and David listening right now, they may smile when I say this, when someone says, I have a unique situation. <laughs> The hundredth time I've heard that this week. Okay. Yeah, like, like, yeah. And so for a lot of those unique situations, it was an informational delivery gap where they, they required an information source to tell them either how to do something or the, the parameters in which they could work in. So developed a bot as again, kind of workforce augmentation where we don't need to hire another head count. Um, and, the bots, uh, which I'll go through later, like everyone gets afraid of AI that, oh, they're coming for our jobs. And that's why I regularly use the term workforce augmentation, because that's all it is. We're adding a workforce multiplier to make your job easier. And so originally did that with yeah. Walmart. Um, well, you're that. really, you're getting rid of the busy work and you're answering the easy questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, and I think we're all in favor of that. I mean, sure. how many times does somebody ask you a dumb question at work and it's the 50th time? 
and you're like, geez, I wish I could just put a sign on my door with the answer to this question. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're doing with a bot, right? Yeah. Well, a, a, a great thing that I always end up doing in whenever we have initial uh, consultations with our clients, one of the first questions that I ask is, uh, what is the thing that you hate most about your day? And odds are we could probably automate it. Hmm. And if we can automate it, then that means that you no longer have that pain point, which pain points will cause human beings to procrastinate. We don't want to do what we we don't want to do. I had a former manager that always told me uh, she was originally from Costa Rica. And she would use um, a, a statement with us that always eat your frog at the beginning of the day. Yeah, like, if the, if the job to eat the frog, eat it for breakfast. Yeah, yep, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Shout out to Rebecca Spencer that taught me that. Yeah, yep, yeah. And it's been, and mine was uh, uh, Fabiola Zuniga. So yeah. um, the so for that, whenever I started to try to make that into my process, I'm realizing I really don't want to do this thing. How do we automate it? And then just essentially made a business off of that. So I, I love the idea of the automation thing because I talk to RMCs all the time, you know, and, and they're always pressured to have, you know, uh, larger caseloads per consultant. But then there's like, well, but we want to offer more, you know, boutique service and we want to have, a, you know, lower file counts and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's this 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 rub right around efficiency and profitability, but also offering a high level of service. I do think there's an interesting opportunity here, also though, where automation and being available twenty four seven is a satisfying customer experience. Sure. Like if I'm only allowed to talk to, like if I'm only allowed to talk to you between the hours of like nine to five. But I have a question at seven and I got to wait till 9 a.m. the next day, which, oh, by the way, now I'm at work and I'm busy. Mm -hmm. I, I take a impersonal chat bot that's available to me now versus a human being that's not. Sure. I, I totally agree. Um, there I mean, is that kind of what you're doing there. I mean, are you are you are you deploying the, the chat bot services within the I mean, within the, the, the service delivery for, for mobility? I mean, is that? Mm -hmm. So at risk, an example, like how you, how you do that? Yeah, absolutely. And at risk of going uh, Star Trek, yeah, I'll give you uh, kind of four different examples. Example one is a bot can take, it can, uh, sub, can conduct a survey a lot faster and easier and more effectively than human. So if you are needing to uh, survey your, your client base or your, your employee base, then that will, I love the quote that you added. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. So yeah. surveys are a primary piece. Uh, second is uh, information delivery, um, where that can be from a like a training platform. So if you have someone, a, a great example that RMCs use this a lot is if you, or even on the corporate side, if you are a corporate mobility team and your recruiting team is asking you for a relocation policy, are they going to give that full policy over to the employee that might not accept the role? And so if they're, let's say if they're going to Walmart and then, Oh, I also have an offer from Amazon. Now I'm going to Amazon with your policy. Thing. Right. Right. And say match this or beat this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is, uh, that's a potential gap uh, because they're, they're losing that ability to control it where a bot, you can enter in a code and it will bring you down a certain path. Let's say if you're going through a candidate experience, then if you uh, actually accept the role, then you enter in a code, it brings you down to your actual benefits at this time, where more detail of how it applies. So you don't need to worry about uh, your information being lost and uh, losing any of uh, that to a potential competitor. Um, the, um, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, no, I mean, this is, this is interesting to me because I was, I was looking at, at your website, at Vindium's website, yeah. and you wrote an article called Artificial Intelligence, A Disruption or the End of HR. Yeah. And I thought that was a provocative article. Mm -hmm. So can you explain, is AI the end of HR? Oh, no, no. And that's, um, that's a great, great point. And um, no, and that's where a lot of people get nervous about that because they'll say things like, but I do benefit consulting, so why would I give that to a bot? So you're giving my job to a bot? Yeah. No, we're giving. Um, there is a there's a gentleman that actually works at Walmart. He's a senior vice president. His name is Joe Parks. I'll give him a shout out. Um, he uses a quote which I shamelessly steal all the time. He says, "Take the robot work from the the human and give it to the robot." 
Yeah. And for things like that, those repetitive tasks, those things that don't require a human in order to do them, yeah. then give it to a bot. If it does require a human to do it, then can you do it in a video, in something scalable, something pre-recorded, a computer-based learning? Um, and that is, so even a traditional bot, it doesn't need to be in a chat form. You can actually talk to it. One platform that we're using right now is that, and we have a, a relocation management company that uses bo our bots to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a corporation that uses our bots as their relocation management company. And they will uh, control it uh, via voice. So something like, you are cooking dinner for your family. And you say, hey, Alexa, have the realtor come on Tuesday at 10 a.m. It can do that. So the more barriers that you're removing from a, a person interacting with potentially another human, people like interacting with humans. But if, if there is a pain point, if I don't have time to uh, talk to someone between nine to five because I happen to be working, my I need to get my family's dinner ready. I need to get my kids. In sure. Bed, sure. When do I talk to my consultant? I, I want to know uh, if you guys are watching this. We got about 32 people live on LinkedIn right now watching this. I'm sure some of them are smart. I've seen some of their names. Um, I want to know what you guys think about bots, about chat bots, about this type of service delivery model. I want to know what your questions are. I want to know about you know things like using voice, like Alexa. You know, um, I want to know what your thoughts are. I want to hear some questions from the audience because this stuff is very provocative to me. I find it very interesting. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk, so I listen to him all the time, right? And he's talking about voice is the new is the new internet. You know, it's the new frontier, right? And you know, when when everybody scrambled to go establish all the dot coms and buy up all the intellectual property out there, right, and all the you know reserve all those spots, right? Mm -hmm. He's saying that voice and being able to stake out voice domains. Um, you know, it was kind of a new thing. And I think it was in his book, Crushing It, actually, which is now three or four years old. This guy's always ahead of things. So when I hear you start talking about that, I mean, is that something that's, is that something that's proprietary? I mean, how does that even work? You know, if I, if I say Alexa, have the realtor, Alexa, have the mover come on Thursday instead of Tuesday, I'm a moving company. How does that even work? How could I do that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so um, part of it is just the uh, uh, voice recognition. And so there are, uh, well, a few different pieces. So uh, part of it is whenever AI is used as a term, AI applies to so many different things. And a lot of people will just say it as a buzzword and not actually recognize what it means. But a great example of it is image recognition. So now you can walk through and use your phone as a uh, surveying tool you can, there's uh, real uh, real estate companies that will walk through a home with their iPads. And yep. then by the time they get to their car, then the description of the property is already written, whether or not there's carpet, crown molding, uh, hardwood floors, what have you, whatever is in there, it will write it for them because it will recognize that. Now, side if, note, side note, I got to stop here. Gotta stop. Are you going to start seeing then five, 10, 15 years from now, people designing their homes so that it's image recognizable. Oh, like I need to make sure this crown molding is like a certain way so that it picks up so that I get credit for it on the listing. And there already at, um, are apps that actually will allow you to create an augmented reality um, where it will, you'll look and be able to see what part of the room will look like something else because you could change colors of walls, things like that. My wife's trying to convince me to paint my living room purple last night. She's on the bear website and she's like, look, oh, look, when if we paint, I'm like, no, get out of here with that. But, <laughs> but yeah, no. And, and I think Wayfair might do some of that too with furniture, mm -hmm. you know, how's this couch going to look in your living room? You know, that's so interesting. And then there's a company Yumbo out there. I don't know if you've heard of Yumbo that does the, uh, the, the video surveys, but uses image recognition and sure. says, okay, that's, you know, that's a, that's 98% probability. That's a refrigerator, you know, 80% probability that's a cabinet. And then they assign, you know, weights and densities to each of those items. And then it figures out basically does a cube sheet at mm -hmm. the end. I wonder, maybe you can help me with this. I'd love to have those guys on, but maybe you can help me with this. What is the accuracy of that? Ah, yes. And and so, and actually, this is something that I talk about a lot of the time when we're doing any data analysis. So yeah. um, a big 
strength of using data analysis and data science in looking at a, a company's data set. Um, that that will end up varying. It, will, it depends on the image recognition. So to answer your question directly, image recognition is eh right now. Um, the the when you say eh, are, put a number on put a number on eh. Oh gosh, uh, probably in the sixties um, percent accuracy. Yeah. Um, okay. Then for uh, data analysis, though, it's running at the high nineties. So it's amazing because it actually well, explain the there. difference. Explain the difference there. You're saying image accuracy 60% data analysis 90% why the discrepancy uh just because so what you're looking at is different pieces of that item so um a great I'll hold up my hand so yep. on my hand there's a ring right so for yep. there um it will look at different structures on here in order for it to make sense yep. the ring is distorting what is on the hand so now this becomes a additional factor huh. it's the reason why when uh you ever see like the recapture uh like when you're logging into a website right. and you click, which is, what's a sign? What's a, how many sidewalks are there? You're yeah. teaching a car how to drive. Yeah. You're teaching a car how to drive itself during that, because that is part of the, the human training of machine learning. That is, that actually, that's is cool. that's so when I'm logging into a website, the authentication process is mm -hmm. also being leveraged to teach a car how to drive. Yes. Yep. You are teaching the machine image recognition. And part of it is, it's all based on probabilities. You're increasing. So, so the I do about a 50, 50 job of getting through those capture things anyway. So, I mean, am I causing accidents? Please? Yep. You are, you are the single <laughs> biggest cause of future accidents of self-driving Teslas. So, <laughs> so when I tell that person in a crosswalk is actually a stop sign, like I'm actually going to kill somebody. One yep. Day. Yeah, you can laugh maniacally after you do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll have never met that person. But um, so anyway, so I'm teaching cars how to drive. I'm, I'm logging into websites. You're saying so 90% data accuracy, though. But like, help me understand. So I get the 60% mm -hmm. vision. But 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 how can if something's only 60% reliable image recognition, how can the data be so so much more reliable? How to. Sure. Uh, yeah, because for that, that's going off of things that machine uh, that are much more uh, defined. Right. So you're looking at um, data sets of a certain range. So without getting too technical into it, you what you're looking at. And I'll, I'll use um, I'll use exception data as an example to pair it to mobility. OK, if you want to go ahead and look at your exception data in order to make a policy change, then you are looking at so many people will look at the. Um, the uh, so we'll look at the difference between causation and correlation. Um, where if you are saying that um, these two items, like oh gosh, when we have higher lump sums, we have lower exceptions, um, then uh, like okay, is that the real reason, or are can you increase another benefit in order to reduce costs? R cost reduction and mobility is one of the highest uh, pieces that uh, the the highest um, survey returns that we have for what people want. And when you're reducing cost, usually you're decreasing employee experience. So to pull it full circle, the, the um, data accuracy is due to looking at a certain data set like exceptions. And then you can say, all right, there are X many of this, X many of this, and it will actually chart it out into a map. It could be a 3D map where you'll see plot points all the way through there where you can look at what could make an impact and then run hypotheticals. Um, now, it's because of those defined terms that it's more accurate. But the benefit of it is that you can find something and run experiments without running experiments on a human. So rather than saying, hey, Ben, you're going to Antarctica. Right. And we found out that all that you need is a rowboat to get you there. Yeah. So you can run data sets with other data sets uh, to make sure how they, to see how they interact together. And that's the benefit of machine learning. That's why a lot of these companies will put out open source uh, information because you are in fact making their machine smarter while you do that. Okay, you blew my mind a little bit here. Now, do you require do you require large data sets though to be able to, you know, predict if I'm able to get to Antarctica with a robot? <laughs> I mean, I would think you would need all those other variables and statistical statistic statistically valid samples of all the different variables and able to suss out whether or not that robo was going to fail me 
Yeah, and that is the that's the benefit of and, and that actually right there specifically is what we talk about when we talk about machine learning, mm -hmm. because the more information that's provided to the machine, the more accurate it's going to be. Because you talk about open open source data. Mm -hmm. We are in an environment right now, and here's a funny so so going to some comments right now. We're in an environment right now where privacy is being prioritized, right? Sure. So so it's being taken in a way we've never seen it taken before, but it's also being being fought for and protected in a way we've never seen it protected before. So it's kind of an interesting battle, right? Um, but in order for this stuff to really work, open source data would be like a dream. Do you see currently open source mobility data? Do you see it uh, or do you see a time when that is available? That is a wonderful question. Thank and you. I would complicate that and pose a question back to you of saying like what data like because i don't know robo yeah. data i don't know <laughs> yeah well so i mean if you, I, I guess so so is there not a, okay is there not a universality of the data that's being collected right well and that's why i was, I was kind of joking and and um saying and that i'm gonna overcomplicate it with that because the what data is the uh, so humans, and this sounds totally negative, but humans lie on surveys, right? We are we are taking a survey from an emotional state at a certain time. We are thinking in a certain frame how we see the world. So whatever that survey point is, um, and the reason why I'm joking and saying what data is, if we're using survey data of open source, like everyone's saying they want these things, eh, why do they want those things? What situation were they in, were in before? Um, right. it, what was their policy standard? So the best bet would have uh, comparable policies and then see the surveys. And then that would be uh, compared against others. So what you're saying is the self-reported data, the self-reported surveys of people, since they're so highly dependent on their mind state at that time, is unreliable. It's unreliable if you're doing it once or twice. Now, the best surveys happen when you will do them consistently. So a great example is a happy smee, uh, happy smees, <laughs> can't talk on Friday, a happy face, a sad face, or a neutral face. Or you can end up doing this in stars or anything like that. Like, how are you feeling right now? And that every time that the person logs into an expense system or every time that they will uh, talk to a consultant or a bot, whatever, uh, if you can just do a quick one click to see what they're the pulse check, then at that point, now you have a, a heat map to go over time to see at which point in the milestones were they uh, feeling a certain way. And then you can have the machine analyze it. And, and you know what? I mean, we're also assuming that we care how they're feeling because we're assuming that that also correlates to other results and outcomes down downstream, right? Like productivity, like how long they stay in, in with the assignment, like their, like their relative value to the organization over time. Mm -hmm. You know, we're assuming that these things are impacted by how happy they are. And I still think there's a lot of studying to be done on that impact right yeah. um, we're assuming happiness equals engagement equals productivity equals longevity equals value to the stock price or whatever mm -hmm. right so i you know I, i've heard some some smart people talk about this and even the smart people i've talked to don't seem to really have it figured out yet mm -hmm. um but but i mean talk about data and then you need like i guess you would call it a longitudinal study study right where mm -hmm. you look over one year, two year, three year, five year, 10 year, and say, what happened to that person mm -hmm. after relocation, taking that large data set, comparing it to what happens to people that don't relocate, you know, the standard population, right? Yeah. I mean, are you able to do so? How much of that are you able to do? Or are we able to do today? Sure. And, and I actually, again, kind of to pose a question back to you. Um, and I'll this question back to me. Yeah. Questions with um, questions. Can you, uh, so, can you, if a client were to ask you, so you've been in, in the moving space for a long time. If a client were to say, what's the ROI of, of moving someone? Could you answer that? No, not definitively. It's and that's part of the, the, to answer my question is, yeah, that, that, that right there is actually, I'd say that the person that is going to put a hard definition on that, they'll be very, very successful. We do have a formula for determining ROI of mobility. 
Yeah. Uh, but for it, it will get extremely complicated over time, and it has to do with production. Um, so, the, and how do you quantify the production? And it, that depends on the role. How do you so, isolate that individual's contribution to the organization? Sure, sure. And, and so it, it, there's certain roles that will have a, a an easy to define one, a salesman. Salespeople. Yeah. yeah. Um, so marketers with a, a some way to determine how many people that they bring in. If you have a, um, the fun ones are going to be, and actually this is kind of part of the nature of uh, AI is at the death of HR, right? So how do you define HR's role? Because HR is innately a cost benefit. And one thing that we try to drive up with, with clients is that even though the HR in mobility is a call center, think of it as an internal business. The internal business wants to generate more business because that's what supports all the people on the team. So when you are considering it a business, then you can look into what's the value for the role. If the value for the role is to perform a task, then can that task be performed cheaper otherwise? If not, we just ran a cost analysis on what that cost for the role would be. So now we have a, at least a determined value, uh, like somewhat of a determined value. It won't be to the penny. It will be highly yeah. accurate, though. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, Andrew. The, you know, I admire you trying mm -hmm. because one yeah. of the most epic failures I've ever experienced <laughs> was trying to do a session at Worldwide ERC on the uh, calculating the ROI of uh, your mobility program. Oh, yeah. And I heard so much pseudoscience around it. Mm -hmm. I heard so much bad math around it. Mm -hmm. And I ultimately ended up bringing in a speaker who was so atrocious. Yeah. Not only was he, did he not know what he was talking about? He actually managed to offend so many protected classes in the oh, room. At time. So it was like insult to injury. Oh, so I admire you trying. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's treacherous. Hold sure. on a second. Let's uh, let's look at some of these comments here because yeah. it's actually kind of it's actually kind of blowing up here. Um, mm -hmm. Got some good stuff here. Uh, let's see here. Lisa Johnson Mark, uh, attributes that quote to Mark Twain. It is widely attributed to Mark Twain, although it's not proven. I've mm -hmm. looked this up too. Call <laughs> bots are a great addition to our service delivery. The focus should be on the CX customer experience. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Um, but how do you measure the CX? And who's your customer? And yeah, who's your customer? Look at this. Mm -hmm. Turn the question right back on them, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I love the idea. Martin Mayot, hey, Alexa, is this service GDPR compliant? Ooh, and it depends. Uh, so we have made bots that are GDPR and CCPA compliant. Uh, they're just custom made. Nice. Uh, Joe Fick, I worked on Star Trek Next Generation. We always did bots and voice recognition. <laughs> yep. Little known fact. Rory Ramirez, hello, everyone. Hey, Rory. Janet Turner, crazy stuff for this boomer. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I was talking. I was talking to uh, to Andrew about this too. I was like, I'm 37. He's 31. Mm -hmm. This stuff is crazy for me. You know, I can't imagine. You know, people that you know are older than me. I mean, it's it's wild stuff, and it's moving so fast, right? Uh, largely, and, and you're an expert in this, right? I, at least I, I try to be. Right? Well, I, would say that. I make a good this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, right, yeah right. <laughs> but even you don't know everything, you know. Yeah, well, that's and, and that's what I mean by uh, try to be. So, and, and that's what I was going to say that I I try to make a habit of hiring people that are smarter than me. And right. a great example of that, and specifically for the generational fact, um, that there are only two people on my team that are older than me. So most of them are in their twenties, and it's because these are people that know how to code in Python. They know how to go ahead and. and create complex algorithms because they live and breathe it. This is, uh, and these are people that also are comfortable that working until one 30 in the morning, um, blaring music in the office and having like screens going, just bring in pizza and they'll be happy. Like it, it's interesting of the different, we were talking about uh, before the session of different workplaces and how they foster, uh, well, and, and basically what your workplace generally is. And, for the new generation, like Gen Z, they are doing a lot more of um, work when they need to, not nine to five. So they may come in at 11, but they, they may be there until two o'clock in the morning. And I love that because a uh, great example. And I, I was bringing this up to them. I had a conversation with them earlier. Every time that I travel, I think more stuff gets done. And I don't know whether or not that's a factor of a negative on me for like being a hindrance to progress 
or if that's a positive on them that they're saying, let's show what we as individuals can create in as an impact. So well, talking- I, think, I think the mark of a I've heard, I've heard oftentimes the mark of a leader is how well the organization does when you're not there anymore. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I mean, but I think I think that's interesting. I think it's interesting. So so then if if you if you've observed that, do you plan to remove yourself from situations more often? Uh, I I haven't been that calculating about it, but it, you know it was it was. A great example of this was that voice command feature of the boss. Um, I was at ERC, and uh, this was uh, the spring ERC. Um, and I, I was talking with some people and saying, you know, we're doing some really exciting stuff with bots. And I suspect by October, we're going to have voice commands. And then um, everyone's really excited about it. I'm, I'm starting to sweat because I'm telling everyone this. And I'm thinking that this is an ambitious goal. By the time I got back, we had voice commands. Wow. Yeah, it was fantastic. And wow. so was, and they didn't wait for you. Right. Right. Well, and so they, they as soon as I got back, they're like, we've got something that you're going to be excited about. Watch. They, you know, they I think a lot of leaders, day. though, can learn something from that anecdote, because how many times you sit in a meeting and you're you're waiting for the leader of the organization to come around to the idea, wrap their head around the idea. And nobody can pass go until they get it and bless it. But everybody else in the room already knows what to do. Sure. They just want to run. You mm-hmm. know, um, good stuff. Cool. Let's go back to some comments here because uh, a couple people here. Uh, mm-hmm. Good question, Mark. Uh, Joe Fick, he's right. It can be done now. I can think of a half a dozen reasons why a realtor or DSC can use voice. Also, a half dozen how you can end up being in a lawsuit using it as a realtor. Oh, yes. That is a whole part of it. Yep. Have you seen any lawsuits or uh, anything that resulting from any of this type of tech? Uh, so we did have a, a challenge, uh, not that that resulted in a lawsuit, but uh, voice recognition has a hard time picking up accents. So uh, with like a diverse and inclusive teams, if you have someone from another country that may have a proficiency in English, but they cannot give a voice command. So depending on how much that you you push that, there's yeah. a weakness in that point. Well, and I mean, think about it. I mean, we're, it's mobility, right? So, I mean, we have assignees from all over the world. So. Okay. I mean, it's pertinent. It's extremely pertinent with us. So that's. So what do you, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Uh, just have uh, multiple forms of communication. So you can either communicate via voice, uh, through buttons. So pre-selected responses. So if the, that's best, if there already is a language barrier, if if you don't want to translate it, you could always translate it. Um, well, I mean, yeah, like like that's with my emails. When I'm typing an email, mm-hmm. or you call me and I'm on the other line. Oh, you know, can I call you later? Or oh, I'm on my way. Or, right. I mean, really, there's three or five. Mm-hmm. possible outcomes to this question <laughs> like yeah, and that's image recognition ai that you're interacting with because it's seeing what you're writing and so then it knows that okay a proper response of this will be this and the more times you click on that you're teaching the machine to be smarter and then i love i love like on uh like uh linkedin does this sometimes mm-hmm. like uh it's like oh happy birthday say you want to go through and you want to you know wish everybody a happy birthday you know uh one will say happy birthday andrew or another will say like uh you know, have a great birthday, Andrew. Or like, it'll switch it up for you, so everybody's not getting the same happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. you, know, so you can still use it, and a few options to choose from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you don't look so callous and uncaring. Mm-hmm. Nice of them. Uh, Martin May, uh, follow up would would be: Are the suppliers GDPR compliant? So are the suppliers GDPR compliant then? Um. So suppliers of if, if you're using, say, if you're using voice or if you're using bots, bots or voice. Yes. Uh, and, and so that's where we have. Uh, so the, the bots that we custom design are GDPR and CCPA compliant. Um, and that's specifically because they're uh, originally we start we did that purposely because there was a client that was going into the UK and they needed to have um, uh, information delivery and information collection that was GDPR compliant. Um, and so, yes. Uh, so we do and we don't. For people that are just using it internally within the U.S. and don't care about CCPA, then uh, then it can you, you just are. I always encourage clients to be as open with their uh, employee base or their client base as possible when they are collecting their data, because you don't want to you don't want to be that company that's collecting all their information holding it forever and you in selling it, you want to use it for productive means that they're aware of what you're using it for and that they're okay with. Cool. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Paula Cupkick says, Andrew, spot on. Bots will allow for cost savings without impacting our customers. Cool. Uh, Martin uh, Martin says, Andrew, you're killing it. Congrats, and thank you for sharing this. <laughs> thank you. Now you are. I mean, this is a really interesting topic. No, um, I appreciate it. Uh, ROI is the unicorn, Paula mm -hmm. says. Oh, yes. I actually, I always, I use that exact terminology, the mythical creature that cannot be captured. I love that. Yeah. And does it even exist? Mm -hmm. um, I, I see. Okay. I want to say something too. So, so I've been playing with this idea that, that ROI is like one of the worst ideas that we can have because it leads to the pursuit of figuring it out, mm -hmm. which then in turn causes analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. And then means you can't ever do anything because if you're waiting for a positive ROI to pursue something mm -hmm. and it can't be figured out, then you just say, oh, it's not worth it. Uh, and then you never do anything and then yep. you just die. So, yeah. And there's a book um, uh, by Simon Sinek, uh, Infinite, gosh, uh, of course, now I'll forget the name, uh, Infinite, um, like uh, Thought Infinite Leader, something like that. Mm -hmm. And in that, he specifically refers to the, um, how um, the difference between production and how like a great example is uh, if you are looking for pure production, then at that point, you're going to have a narcissistic individual on your team. You're, that's They're going to be cutting the throats of their young in order to get ahead. And you do not want that. You want the right. education of people that are uh, both productive, uh, that practice both physical security, so the productivity in order to uh, support the team and the emotional security with the team of fostering the emotional connections and the soft skills within people. Yeah, in infinite game. Infinite game, thank you. Infinite game, game. yeah. And so so that first one was me in my 20s and that second one is me in my 30s now. Sure. And it was such a revelation for me. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, and, and likewise as well. I mean, I think that's why I like fell on my face a number of times, probably more times than I could count because of um, thinking that, oh gosh, I know everything in the world. And the more you know, the more that you find out you don't know. You don't know. And and that results aren't everything or immediate results aren't everything. And it's the way you the way you do business, you know. And um yeah, that's still something I'm learning, you know. Yeah. Uh Hosea Botley, great topic. Thanks, Hosea. Roy Ramirez has a question. Yeah. Does the voice recognition know how to differentiate between family members that have similar voices? Yes. Oh, gosh, that is a fantastic question. And this is something that we, we regularly um, work with. So the voice recognition that we use um, is typically partnered with something like Alexa or a Siri or a uh, Google Home The because they already have the... It, be cost prohibitive to our clients if we went ahead and built that from scratch every single time. And it wouldn't be as good because every time that you use Siri, you're increasing its effectiveness. So if you have a, um, a voice that you're, um, well, so to answer the question directly, typically not because there wouldn't, I, I'd be curious to know of a situation where we, you would want it to recognize a difference um, and uh, we can totally brainstorm this. I could actually, well, be well, let's go down this path, right? Let's go down this path. So say, um, let's say we're working. And so he kind of like specifies as in businesses that are family owned or run. Right. So mm -hmm. let's say like, let's say, um, let's say you're my dad. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's get weird. So you're my dad, <laughs> I'm your son. Right. And, and we've grown up together. So we kind of have similar voices, accents, whatever. Right. Yeah. And, but you're the dad and you're the CEO of the company and mm -hmm. I'm like, just the guy. Okay. And so you can make decisions about changing, Hey, make sure the delivery shows up on this day. And you don't want me necessarily to have that access, right? That permission. Uh, yeah. So we're dealing with like permissions and accesses and stuff. Mm -hmm. because now when you're not logging into a system and authenticating with a password, mm -hmm. but you're using your voice patterns to authenticate, uh, you know, or your facial recognition and we're twins or something, yep. right? How do you, how do you do that? Ah, yes. And also I'll plug another book of, um, there's a book called Speed and I highly recommend uh, anyone to read that. It is a gentleman that, um, very, very, very intelligent gentleman uh, from Poland um, that he leads um, the internet of things for Ernst & Young. 
So um, there is a, in whenever you're dealing with data security and especially in those regards, so there's different ways to do it. So you can do it through a password. Um, so you can just base off of that. The highest level of security is going to be both what you know and what you have. So if you have a physical token or something that is, is only you can have and not, not even your face would be something like your fingerprint and also facial recognition, um, it's improving, but it's not as good as fingerprint um, scans right now. Uh, there's actually stories of this, of people that are of a similar culture that will look alike. Um, so not even twins, but people of a similar culture that they'll say like, oh, these are the same person. So the best way to do it is by having some kind of token, like some something physically that you have or something physically that you know, um, those two combos will be the highest level of security. So that's like a two-factor authentication mm -hmm. of sorts. Man, um, so this has been this has been really eye-opening. Uh, <laughs> this is frankly not where I thought this conversation was going to go. Oh but, no, it's been fun. <laughs> right? it's been a lot of fun, you know. And I love I love talking about ideas with people. Mm -hmm. That's really what this show is all about: is getting getting into ideas and and. Um, it's been really cool. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for sharing your story. You know, Andrew, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our audience uh, while you have the opportunity? No. So, you know, part of the, I think kind of the overarching lesson and whenever we end up talking about these kind of, you know, big um, theoretical items, because so, a lot of it is theory when we're talking about how it could apply in certain situations is never be afraid to incorporate additional technology when you think that um, when the fear is based on uh, role elimination, because it's not the role elimination, you can always change someone's role. It's like, again, to plug another book, the good to great. Sometimes you just need to change someone's seat on the bus in order to make the biggest impact mm -hmm. and look for workforce augmentation tools where you can automate your pain points and simplify your processes. So then again, to quote Joe Park of taking the robot from the human and giving it to the robot. Awesome. Well, thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate joining Love and Reload, talking about Vendium, talking about your story, talking about AI, bots. <laughs> I mean, this is really awesome, man. This is a great way to, to end my week, man. So thank you so much for making time for us. I really appreciate it. Likewise, I really appreciate the invite. And yeah, uh, thank you, everyone that joined in. And this has been a lot of fun. And um, yeah, look forward to staying connected. Awesome. 